We're going to talk about Black financial wealth building. And uh, we have our guest, uh, our special guest, uh, Brother David Fontaine. I mean, even that name sounds cool. So um, I want to share this. Uh, you know, I, I started uh, doing a little research and I, and I ended up going, oh, God. I ended up going to his um, uh, website here. And, you know, he has this wealth building guide and all of these principles. And if you want to contact with him, and then I went to his Facebook page and, and uh, he has all of this information, all this great stuff. And he's even on SoundCloud. His, his book is, is on SoundCloud. So um, I didn't know that. <laughs> you, you didn't know that. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, great. Thank you. Uh, give thanks and praise to the Most High uh, for uh, bringing us Amen. such a, a knowledgeable guest. Brother David, I'm turning everything over to you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Well, well thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm uh, honored. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to your community. Uh, you're, you're so well known and you've done so much good over the years. And it's the first time I ever had the chance to interact with you. And so it's a, really an honor and a privilege to, to be here this afternoon. Uh, I think I'll start off by telling you a little bit about, about myself. I was uh, born and raised here in Sacramento, California, in Del Paso Heights. Uh, my dad was, uh, was a minister. I'm a PK son, uh, brought up in a non-denominational church. And my, I, uh, that, and my dad was a minister, my mother, worked as a cafeteria, was the head of the cooks in the cafeteria in the Del Paso Elementary School District. And she started the first, uh, uh, I would call it, free, head, free foods, free, <laughs> uh, head start for children. Basically, she, she had a way of recognizing the poor children that didn't, weren't able to eat before they officially had the uh, free, the free breakfast programs and that kind of thing. She was providing those services to, uh, to the youth in the community at the school. And that was before it was free lunch, before there was Head Start and all of that. But she just kind of did that on her own with the cooks there in, at Del Paso, Elementary, Del Paso Elementary School. But uh, how I came up with the principles for this book, I was a very mischievous child. And so about every six to nine months, I would get a whooping by my dad. My dad was 6'4", 220 pound gentleman, minister. And so I would, my mother would say, boy, do something wrong with your dad, get home, you don't get it. So what would happen, I'd, I'd be preparing for my dad to come home. And, and so when he gets home, my mother tells him what I've done. And so I would go in and lay on the bed, and prepare for my whooping. And, uh, about every third or fourth time, he would come in with the Bible, and he would have a scripture be reading to me. And when I saw that Bible, I was very happy because I know that was a reprieve. I wasn't going to get a whipping, but he decided to give me a re reprieve. And so, but then he would sit down with me for two or three minutes, and he would go over one of life's principles. And one of the scriptures that he, he went, would go over was Psalms 1 and 1. He talk, talks about the goodness of the blessings of, the, of God, the blessings of God. And so I did, he would always uh, give me one of those life lessons. And so when I be, uh, went into the financial service industry over a number of years and opened my own Allstate insurance agency up, I realized that there were certain, certain financial lessons that if principles, that if you live by these financial principles, that you would grow, you could grow wealthy and do very well. And so I actually got those pencils from my dad teaching me those lessons of life when I received those reprieves for being such a mischievous child. Um, so I, I was about, after I sold my business uh, in 2006, I was beginning to feel my immortality. So I felt that I had had a, a few experiences in life. And so I decided to put them on paper and before I leave here. And so I came up with the, with the uh, 10 or 12 financial principles. Some of them are well-known principles. They're not brand new. You know, many of those you've heard, but I think I do have some principles here that, that, are, that are, are a bit unique. And 
one of the things that I, when I was in my business, I always came with people, we, I saw the, the lack of financial knowledge, lack of financial knowledge in our community, specifically the minority community, black community, Hispanic community. And it, so after I retired, I wrote, I wrote this book with these principles. And one of the things I always like to talk about, and I'm, everyone's very much made aware of, is that the large wealth gap between the African in the American community and the majority community. community. And our community is about, the median income from the African American community is about $24,000 versus $189,000 of the majority community. And, um, and so what I, what I did is I, in the book, I outlined what you can do individually, what you can do as a family, and what we must do as community to narrow this, this large wealth gap that we have. Uh, presently, we are a one, we have $1.6 trillion economy in the African American community. That would make us the largest nation in the world economically. So my theory is, is that it's not that we don't have enough money, it's that we don't do well with the money that we have. We certainly have enough money because you can look in our community daily and you can see many different businesses being established, hair businesses, uh, grocery stores, liquor stores, none of us, none of them being owned by us. So the money is within our community to do what we have to do, what we have to do uh, economically to decrease this, this large wealth gap. My, my theory is this here, is that we cannot depend on the majority community for anything. If it's going to be done, we have to do it ourselves. You can't expect people that put you in the situation that you're in to provide, to provide a solution to the problem that's presented before you. And so they benefit from this system. They benefit from the, the large wealth gap. So we must, as a people, must be united as one. And we must look within ourselves and with our own community for the solutions to mirror the, the, net, the large wealth gap. Uh, I'd like to read something that uh, Malcolm X said. Malcolm X kind of froze there, David. Said this: Malcolm X on Black economics of your community in which you live, the community in which you spend your dollar becomes richer and richer. That's that's Malcolm X, and um, I think that. One of the things that I, that I have found is that we as a people will not get to where we want to, want to be or we will not be able to lower this wealth gap and spend businesses at, uh, spend money at, at African American businesses. If you don't love yourself or if you don't love your people, I can, you can have the greatest plan in the world, but if you don't love yourself, which means you feel like you're less down, less than, or you feel that you're, you're not good enough, or you don't believe in, in yourself, then you can easily be manipulated by the forces that be, the media, the forces that be, to get you off your plan. So if you have a budget, and uh, you're trying to stay on that budget, and let's say, for instance, that you have a, a, a problem with your significant other, or you may have a problem with your children, or what, what have you. But in order to anesthetize that situation. A lot of us go out and we, we buy this uh, nice car or we, if we go buy this nice set of jewelry or we go out and buy this purchase that we didn't actually plan for. So that makes us feel good for a little while, but that doesn't really, that doesn't do anything to correct the problem that we have. Now, one of the major problems we have is not spending money at African-American businesses. Now, if you don't, believe in your people, if you don't love your people, you're not going to go to, you're not going to go to a market or you're not going to go to a place where your people are. You're not going to frequent their businesses. There's the old story about the story is this. The ice, the two ice companies, the black man. And so uh, John asked his friend, Levi, 
Levi, why do you always pass the black ice company and go to the white ice company? And Levi told him, because the white man's ice is colder. And that's, that's kind of a problem that some of us have. It's, it's something we believe, we don't believe that our people are, are good or it can be as good. When we don't love our people, we all feel like, we all feel like they're less than and not enough, excuse me. So again, if you don't love yourself or love your people, it's hard to, it's hard to follow these plans and stick with these plans because we, we are being bombarded daily with messages from TV and, and media to, uh, to, to spin that if you don't, if you're not keeping up with the Joneses, or if you don't have this, you're nothing, or if you don't have lived in this neighborhood, you're, you're, you're not enough. And so in order to count, counteract that, we must love ourselves, teach, know who we are as a people and as an individual as well. Okay. First of all, I'd like to start with four basic uh, financial literacy principles that I believe I'm going to ask you these questions. You don't have to answer them, but you can kind of answer them uh, within your within your within your mind. And the first principle would be: Do you know what your credit score is? If you have a credit card, maybe some of you don't have credit cards, but you, you know what your credit score is. And that's the score that runs between 350 and 900. And so if that credit score is above 7, 740, 750, you're doing pretty good. Anything below 740 is, is good. Less than that, uh, you're getting the five and 600, that's, that's poor. And of course, the better credit you do, the credit, credit you have, uh, the cheaper that car, that home, or any purchase that you make with a credit card will, will be if you're, able to, uh, if you're able to qualify for it at all. The next question would be, do you know what the interest rates are on the credit cards that you do have? Okay. All right, okay. And the third question would be, do you know your retirement score? Now your retirement score, I, I call the retirement score is how much money you need to save to live in the lifestyle that you would like to live once, let's say you, you retire. Now, some of us may not, no, may not ever retire. <laughs> we may be all working at some time and doing something. But let's say if you want to officially get off the man's plantation, uh, if you say, uh, say you want to retire at 65. And let's say you are have been employed with another employer for the last 35 years. And this the employer should be able to tell you, or if you have a 401k plan, if you were to retire at that particular moment, how much money you would receive monthly in your retirement plan. Okay. So let's say that they said it's four thousand dollars a month. Okay. And you and you've decided looking at your income and your expenses that you need, uh that you need 500, you need uh, $5,000 a month, okay? So that, that tells you the amount of money you have to save to make up that, that $1,000 difference. So when you retire, you have 5,000 versus 4,000. That's what I call that your retirement number. Now, if, you, if you're working for yourself, if you have your own business, then you, have, you can go to, there's calculations that you can go to, most banks, most credit unions have them, and they will tell you that if you save this amount per month in, in 25 years, you will have this amount of money, which will allocate out to so much income per month. Okay, I'm doing a lot of talking. Any questions? <laughs> what I'm going through is anybody can jump in anytime. Any question that you have in reference to something you're not, it's not clear or not, or just go right ahead and ask me. Uh, I don't want to go through this. We don't have to wait to the end. Let's go right ahead. I missed that uh, quote from Mike from Malcolm X. Could you say that again? When you spend your dollars out of your community in which you live, the community in which you spend your dollars becomes richer and richer. The community out of which you take your money becomes poorer and poorer. 
Okay. I have a quick uh, comment. I really enjoyed these various criteria that you picked out, but something triggered in my head is that if you come up with a certain amount of money that you know you're going to need in retirement, then it will behoove you, I would think, to stay in that particular area. Because if you lived in Mississippi <laughs> as you was working, you see where I'm going, right? If you lived in exactly Mississippi and you knew how much money you were going to get, and you said, oh, I want to get out of this cold weather. I want to move to California. <laughs> well, that money that you thought you had in Mississippi is peanuts here in California. So I was just thinking that in my head, but that was all. So you, you're so right. You make me think of, uh, well, that we have something a little more localized than that. We have people that live in the Bay Area and they move to Sacramento and they're very happy because the, you know, the medium income in the, of a home in the Bay Area is three times what it is in Sacramento. Uh, I had a gentleman that I worked with. He said he was the only one in his block that had a mortgage payment because all the other four or five people lived there, lived in the Bay Area and sold their home and paid to Sacramento and paid their home off. So, so you're certainly right. So uh, a lot, that's why we've also seen a lot of great migration to Atlanta because uh, uh, the cost of living there is increasing. But at one time in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s, there was a large discrepancy in what a home was in the South in Atlanta versus California. And even Las Vegas, a lot of it's still a little less there, but the same uh, thing goes to Las Vegas as well. Uh, the last principle would be, with far as the retirement would be the rule of the rule of 72 and the rule of 72 is if you take it, it it actually tells you how long it will take you to double your money at a certain interest rate so let's say if you uh have a 10 percent mortgage if, you, if you're earning 10 percent on your money if you divide that 10 percent into 72, that tells you it will take 7.2 years to double your money, okay? If you divide five into 72, that tells you how long it will take to double your money at a certain interest rate. Right now, interest rates are earning four or five cents. If you, if you had your money in a, in a savings account or any kind of a mutual fund or that kind of, that kind of fund, a money market fund, it'll tell you how long it will take for you to double your money. Just Divide that interest rate into 72, whatever it is, it'll tell you what length of time it takes you to double, to double your money. Um, well, let me, so right now, any questions for, I'm gonna go into some more specifics of, of, of basic principles, the specifics uh, right now. In, in, any other questions right now? Okay, all right. You're going good, man. So I'm gonna go. Okay, so I'm going to go, first of all, I'm going to go into the, uh, the 11 wealth building principles for individual family and community wealth. The first one I have is, is pay 10% of your net to the church or other wor worthy or organizations. If you put this principle first, the other 10 will be much easier to follow. Those that give first receive much more back. The pleasure of giving and saving must exceed the pleasure of spending. That's, that's the first principle. I say giving back. Everybody doesn't want to pay, you know, that 10% in ties. So if you can give that back in other ways, charity, your work, volunteer work, what have you, there, there's all kinds of ways you can give back other than just giving and financial, the financial dollars as well. So that's the first principle I have. The second principle I have is always live below your means. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. Uh, if you go into a mortgage company, you wish to buy a home and you go to the, the loan officer there and the loan officer says, well, you know, Mr. J Mr. Jones, you can afford a $2,000 a month payment. So what you do, you say, well, if, I'm going to get a home where I only need to pay $1,500 a month. If you take that $500 difference and you invest it in the stock market for 30 years, and the stock market has earned an average 
from 7 to 10% over the last 30 years. That amount of money would have grown to $613,000 in a 30 year period. If you leave it alone, <laughs> you leave it alone. That's three times the amount that the average American family has, has saved for retirement. So that's an example of living below, below your means. Uh, the most, the, the car that is driven most by millionaires in this country are Ford Explorers and they used to be Ford, Ford Tyruses. Now they could afford, they can afford uh, a car that costs a lot more, certainly qualified, but they choose to take that money, that difference and invest it in the, in the stock market or real estate or their own individual businesses. So that's, that's the first principle. So always live below your means. The, the next one, as I say, is have a budget and stick with it. That's, that's a little easier if you have a banking account now. They have, they'll let you on their bank app. They, they'll tell you how much money you're spending a month. If you're spending more than you have taking it in, but always have a money. I always have a budget. Stick within that budget as best you can and have a five or five to ten percent cushion. Now, as African Americans, a lot of us that that we have other pressures on us that other communities don't have, you know, in some situations. Uh, that means that we, you know, we may need to help an aunt or we need to help a, a uncle or or maybe a sister or brother that's that's in need. So we have to, we have a little different, you have to individualize this and have a little different circumstance when, when you're budgeting. But try to have enough to just have a 5% cushion for those unexpected expenses that will that will, will come up. Okay. All right. I always say this, pay yourself first. Have at least 10% of your monthly payment go directly towards savings savings account. This is your saving vehicles for retirement, a new business, your children's education. And the government's going to get their money. They get their money first. They're going to take the Social Security. They're going to take the California. going to take the state income. The federal government's going to, they're going to get the, so, it's, so get, get your money first. Just, just get yourself in the mindset that you're the government, but you're the government of, of I'm the government of David Fontaine or I'm the government from M I'm, I'm the government. <laughs> so pay yourself first. So just automatically have a vehicle where, from your checking account or what, where have you, electronically have it into your mutual fund, into your savings account. When I uh, had my first job out of college, I was making $600 a month. That was, that was gross. And I saved, I was having $20 a week going into my uh, savings account automatically. So I was investing 80 $80, I was saving $80, this is 1974 now. <laughs> I was saving $80, $80 a month, but I had a budget of $9 a month, a food budget. And so I made sure I, for about six, you know, didn't eat any steak or any actual amount of money because I wasn't, I was making 600, but I was only getting home with about 500 of that. And so basically I was saving almost 15 to 17% of my money at that time, that time by having it go automatically into a vehicle where you don't see it. It's just there. You forget about it. Okay. The other, the fourth principle is Ujama, the African, the African American. Before you go any further, you invest, before you go any right further, ahead. saving your money, I, I tell my grandchildren and my children, I taught them, I don't care if you save a quarter every time you get paid. The whole right. part, point of it is to be disciplined and saving and not touching it. You said it. And as you, you you're able to say, put away more, then you put away more. But always save something. So that's this. well said. You couldn't say it any better. <laughs> you know, it's it's good to have you speak up like that because. You know, a lot of us African Americans are in what we call, I would call, and I've heard this before, financial deserts. This means that we're not we're not around anybody that talks finances or maybe knows about knows about finances, you know. And so some of us, despite that, have done well because we've had grandmothers like you. <laughs> 
that fortunately are grandfathers that able to give their children, their grandchildren, or their, their own children those those bits of wisdom. But majority, of, a lot of us don't have that. We'll talk about everything, talk about each other, <laughs> but we'll talk about everything, but none. Uh, I'll I'll give you an example that. Uh, how our community may differ from another country. Was, had a neighbor, it was an Indian, an Indian neighbor. And they were always, was, they were always seven or eight of them in the garage talking. It seemed like every weekend. And so I asked him, I said, what do you guys be talking, what do you be doing? You be meeting there? He said, we be talking business. We talking business, how we can help one another, how, what, what's, what's the newest business trend? What, what other business can we get into? How we can help one another? Okay, okay, now I got it. Because we're we're we're, we're great on socializing, but we just maybe social we gotta socialize, including a little business and that socializing as well. And that's 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 very important. So what I say, if you if you have an idea for a business, if you can't if you don't have the resources yourself, ask your sister or brother or relative. They may want to they may they, they want to go in business with you. To buy that to buy that rental property, or to, they may have some expertise that you don't have, but ask and seek others like-minded people like yourself to go in business with you. Cooperative economics. Um, we we're some of the most individualistic. We bought the American dream, hook, line, and sinker. But every one of the reasons why a lot of the immigrant communities do so well coming here. And African communities, when I say immigrants, I'm including African communities because the, the Africans that migrate from Africa, their income, medium income is just about equal to what the white communities is. So, so what, I, what I'm saying is that it's, it's an attitude. They bring that culture of working together, saving, investing, working together with them here. And because America is a company, a country that's built on business and all the laws and rules are made for, for business. You know, any, you go in business, any penny you spend can be written off. By writing that off, that goes to Schedule C, that's going to lower your taxes. That's going to lower the amount that you're going to pay, pay monthly, yearly in taxes. So people come to this country they'll die trying to get to this country because they see the opportunity. And, and some of us here are right here and we don't, we don't see that opportunity. So in JAMA, cooperative investing is, 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 is very, very important. And that's why I like your community. You're a, you're a cooperative community. You know, we say it's a cooperative community. You, 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 you know, you have the, the, the Kwanzaa principle, you know the Kwanzaa principles and what they mean individually and collectively as a community, which, which is so important. We just, we all just have to do a better job of getting our, 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 our communicating with, with our brothers and sisters around us, our, our, our kin brothers and sisters around us. Cooperative economics is, is very important. That's very nice of you to say. Uh, we're we're a work in progress. Just be just be just be the truth. That's all. <laughs> it's easy when you're speaking the truth. When you're lying, it's kind of hard sometimes. <laughs> but uh, you know, if you're not, if you want to go and solicit solicit family, friends, and relatives, and relatives invest with you. If not, starting a club organization that pools its money to invest in a new or existing business. Many churches and fraternal organizations have established corporations to promote job creation and economic development. In my book, I talk specifically about churches. I give an example of five or six churches that have basically transformed their immediate community around them by investing in their community, by taking a portion of their tithes and offering and using it for economic development, uh, for starting businesses, for revitalizing, uh, to do affordable housing. But one of the things I also talk about is that the civil rights movement would not have been successful without the black church. They provided the moral, the spiritual, 
and, and the shock troops, so to speak, the, the people to make the civil rights movement uh, successful. Now, if we're going to fight the, the financial literacy problem, the lack of economic knowledge, the specific knowledge, we have to have the we have to have the black church involved. They're still the preeminent institution in our community. Maybe not the same influence that they once had, but they still are the preeminent institution in our community. Our black church has taken more than 13, 18 billion dollars a year in tithes and offerings. Would you, you repeat, just get a would you repeat that, that please? The economic would you repeat that figure? Our African American black church is 13 to 15 billion dollars a year. They're taking 13, 15 billion dollars a year. The proportion of that can be allocated. Most of that goes into institutions that do very little for us, first of all. Secondly, if a, if a portion of that can be allocated to economic development, community improvement, that would make a, a great difference. Or if they had specific programs of financial literacy within the community, if as little as, and I outline this in my book, as little as something, uh, an app, and now you can be on a, it can be an app, or you can have a booklet that just talks about the, the businesses of people that have businesses within your, your church or your community or neighborhood. So they have access and they know who those, those, those people are, those business people are, and they must support those people, support those businesses. And, uh, and I'm sure you, you all know this is that, that the dollar spends an average of six hours in our community versus 22 days in, in, the, in the white community. And so the longer a dollar stays in your community, the more hands it touches and the more, and the more good it can do. But it's like the quote from Malcolm X, we're getting poorer and poorer if that dollar is going out, it's going towards outside communities and not stand within, within our own community. And I think that the churches have to be an integral part of the financial literacy solution and our economic uh, solution as well. Another one of my other principles is- uh, Brother David, that, we, have a, we have a question. Yes, uh, we have a question. Yes, sir, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I, as I listen to you and, and all the, the, the points that you've given us are, are very good, but uh, what continues to spin around in my mind is uh, is our mental attitude towards towards wealth, mm -hmm. and of course, a lot of that is the work that that the Wilsey community is involved in and has been involved in, and in, in, in trying to educate people and give people a sense of themselves and and instill love in themselves and their people. And also the fact that the black church takes in so much money, it seems like we, that need to be a crucial or, or cornerstone of black churches. Is, is, is yes. not just teaching the gospel, but really right. teaching and focusing on black people to instill a sense of love in themselves and a sense of love in their mm -hmm. people. And it, it, it seems to me that should be kind of a fundamental aspect of all religious training and teaching. And that way we begin to cultivate uh, uh, an attitude towards, uh, towards giving, towards uh, uh, loving and, and developing things mm -hmm. for ourselves and for our community. And, um, uh, I'm not sure how we, we may get that message out, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that's about a, a, a fundamental aspect of building the type of wealth that we need as a people to begin to lift ourselves out of the malaise, the economic malaise that we continually find ourselves in. I mean, the spending our money within six hours, um, <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, that's just like, wow, man. You know, yeah. just stop for a minute, you know, and don't spend that money for, you know, say for a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, don't spend that money outside of the community for a week or so. But mm -hmm. different tactics and thinking right. and attitudes to begin to generate some sense in people's mind and mentality 
as to how to go about to help to build up the community and and uh, economic, uh, 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 not necessarily wealth, but just economic uh, uh, soundness within right. our own individual communities. Brother, you said it. You said it well. I mean, I couldn't you say it any better. You, you, you out, tremendous. I really appreciate that. I do have a chapter in my book, chapter nine, says the Black Church, the key institution for building wealth and economic empowerment. Black Church, a template for economic success and community empowerment, programs to be implemented by Black churches. So I do have a, a start of some programs that they can implement to do some of the things that you're talking about. It's certainly not as holistic as you talked about. Uh, hopefully they can combine the love with the economics that like you said, which, which, are, which are very, that's all gotta be, that's all about loving yourself and loving your people again. But uh, it, you're right, it seems like something missing. If they don't have that, that economic piece, something fundamental is, 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 is definitely missing, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. Uh, Another hand, uh, uh, br Brother Shango. Go, go right ahead, brother. Yeah. I like to somewhat piggyback off of what uh, Brother Katabazi was saying as far as, I would say, working collectively. But it, to me, it has to start early. You can't wait till you get older. Mm -hmm. You got to start early. And an example that I would throw out as far as working together, I used to do some tutoring at Country Coastal College. And I used mm -hmm. to wonder, why are the Asian students doing so well in school and we are struggling? And so then something, I heard them, one of the uh, Asian students talking to the other one, okay, let's get to the library. And so after the class was over, I said, let me just follow them and just see what's going on. <laughs> okay, so they had their homework assignment and you had about, say about 10 problems or something to work on. The people in the class, went to the library and each student picked out one example to work on. And they worked on that one example. And then they shared it among one another. So mm -hmm. all they had to do was one problem. Whereas right, I looked right. over at the black student, he was all by himself struggling through every one of them. So after a period of time, they were gone and he was still there because it was just wow. him. It's something just as basic as that. They knew early, if you wanted to progress, you had to work as a team rather than mm. listening to Ayn Rand and do it as an individual. That's all I got to mm -hmm. say. Right. But we, have been conditioned. but we have been conditioned and they have not necessarily conditioned, but they have been dividing us and splitting us up from day one. And right now, mm -hmm. Some of, we are so into it and they have, they did the subliminal seductions on us and all of that stuff. We still have not come out of that. And, and that's unfortunate, but yeah, that, that's why we, we struggle like that. The Asian percent, that's just what I was gonna say. Is higher. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was that Sugar D? Who was that? Yes, yes it was. I, yes. I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, I, um, I, I tried to get my sister to do something with me and she said, you know, like, um, I do my stuff on my own, you know, like, don't, like, I don't want anybody telling me, I don't want any, you know, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I came back like a couple times, but that sense of independence and not trusting is very, very, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say this one thing, because you know, I have definitely gone to some um, African American stores and things like that, and I've really struggled with getting either service or quality. And I know, yeah. I, I know you guys know it's not just, you know, yeah. I wanted to order some food from some place, and you know, they were on the radio, and it sounded so good. And I called and called and called, but they didn't answer. And so finally, I show up and I said, you know, I've been calling for like forty five minutes, and they were like. Oh, we just took the phone off the hook. Too many people were calling. And it was, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's it's more than that. But, but I do want to say, like, I want to finish this on a really positive note because I feel like, like we are so special because we have like, we have like Onyx Village. You know, we have Ile Omade. We have Sister Darnisha. Mm -hmm. and 
people who have businesses right in this company, this uh, organization. And mm-hmm. I wanted to like make sure it's a little more time. We could just throw some money in either of those ways and, and feel really good about it. You know, I, I'll be honest. Sometimes I say like, well, if I do that, it's going to cost a little bit more. But then I tell myself, what am I going to save? Because I'm going to waste it on something else anyway. And so I just really need to, you know, like come to terms with like what's really important. So anyway, thanks very much. What about thank you, Mama. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> One of One the things too, what, I, what is, we've done in our family, because our family, I am now the old the elder in the family. Mm-hmm. And so what I've done is I've gotten my family together, like on my, on my dad's side, I'm working on my dad's side right now, but I'm going to be working on my mom's side soon. So I've gotten us all together. And I said, what projects do we want to work together on as a family? You know, mm-hmm. and, and I've been Perfect. pulling together and we put, we're trying to pull everybody there because children's children, children's been having children. So we really don't know one another. So the first thing that I said was, let's try to establish who we are you know, and that kind of stuff. So we came out with four projects that we're all going to do together. So I'm going to do it with other, those are the things that we need to start doing. And, 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 and I said to them, we're planting the seed for, for the, for our, for the people that are coming up. We even have, we even going to start a, um, a scholarship for within the family for the kids that's coming up. So those are the things that, that we need to really, you know, get out there and focus on because, because we, right. we've been divided for so long. And somebody needs to get up and say, hey, no longer are we going to do this. So it's, it's working yeah. out. Well, I mean, the, we hit or miss. I mean, some people show up, some of them don't. Oh, yeah. Don't that's, that's that. Going back to the first, I, I've had, I had that exact experience this week uh, with somebody I wanted to help me, and they, they, did, they didn't get back to me. So that happened. But what always, when I was in Oklahoma City, Black Wall Street, we talked. And one of the things that we came up with is that, if you get that situation, you let that business know and you correct them. You go to them and you correct them and you tell them. And if, if they don't do better, then they have exempted your, themselves from your business, from you supporting their business. <laughs> if, if, if they don't better themselves, if, if you're going to spend more. So just, you, but we are obligated to correct them and tell them and let them know that what what you have done and what what they aren't doing and what you'd like to see done and if they don't respond to that then you have you have they've lost their right for you have to spend money there you know and i always say spend your money at businesses that will hire your children and reflect your values because if, if they don't reflect your value they won't hire your children i i know i I, they got mad at me at McDonald's and school employees because I went in and said, I don't see any black folks working here. Where are you? They're like, they're like, like they never heard that before, but you have to check them on it. You have to check them on Let them know that you're looking, that, you, that you're looking for somebody. You, you, you're looking for one of your children or your grandchildren. Somebody looks a young teenager there. Let them know. Well, and one lady said, well, I'm not, res- I was not responsible for hiring. They do it downtown. But, but you got to let them know, though. You, you got you to gotta, you gotta talk about it. You got to speak up and let them know that you're watching that, and who they employ, who they don't employ. You know, that's, that's very important. Okay, this, I think this goes right in tune with uh, maybe what he said. Make financial literacy a regular part of the family conversation. We have academic and professional education, but no financial literacy education within the K-12 system. Therefore, we must teach our children and family members the basic fundamentals of owning versus renting, savings, investing versus spending, and what it takes to be an entrepreneur. There are only, there are 15 states of the 50 states that have require financial literacy education. Really? California is not one of those. Really? Really? Yeah, only 15. Yeah. But there was a bill introduced two weeks ago by our our, uh, assemblyman, Kevin McCarthy, to go in that direction with California to have financial literacy as a part of the formal education. Uh, so they're moving that direction. But I, they had it in Oklahoma, which is, I told them, I said, well, you guys aren't known as a progressive, too much of a progressive state, Oklahoma. But they had that. And some of the parents said, well, this poorly tied, it's not very good. <laughs> but you know, it was a start. Uh, one of the things that I, that, that I always like to talk about is that, uh, 
when you invest, diversify your investment portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't invest all your money in one company because if that company goes belly up, there goes your company. If the company goes bankrupt, so does your company's, your, your, your investment. Uh, and I always talk, tell people this when they're people for that those that invest in the stock market. Sell when everybody is, is buying, buy when everybody is selling. I, I mean that to say this here. Is that when you hear all your friends talking about how well they've done, how much their home is appreciated, or how well their stock portfolio has has, has gone up. That's the time if you if you if you're in the, if you're thinking about selling, that's the time to sell. When everybody is speaking of how bad they're not earning any interest on their savings account or their stock portfolios or the, how much their home is going down, that's the time to purchase. An example of that is this: you have to be opportunistic as as an investor. An example: in 2008, over six million Americans lost their home, a tragic case, tragic, poor. But what you have to realize is that there were 6 million people that purchased those homes as well at rock bottom prices. Many of those homes have appreciated two to three times what they were worth in 2008. That's what I mean, buy low, buy when it's low, sell when things are high. So you have to be opportunistic when you do that. D okay. David, David, I have a Go right question. Go right ahead. I'm sorry. Um, Go right ahead. I'm sorry. So, uh, I mean, you're you're in this business and you've written books and, and et cetera. How uh, how have you uh, been? How have you approached young people with this philosophy of financial literacy? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's my biggest challenge. <laughs> That's been my biggest challenge. I, I've been trying to crack that and that right matter of fact, why was this so disappointed this week when I went to this African American business? I was approaching them how I could get on uh, TikTok <laughs> and Instagram where the young people are. You have to go where they are. And that's that's where they are. It's just like I remember years ago, I used to call my son on the phone and he never answered, called, never called me back. I texted him one time, he got right back to me and he hit me. I got to text him if I want to talk to him. <laughs> you you got to go where they are. So I was trying to go where they are on Instagram and TikTok with, with my, you know, with my book and media presence and that kind of thing. I was trying to bring the message there and uh, you just got to go where they are and reach them. But you know, you, you got to get down to their level too. You know, when I, when I have spoke to you, I, I get down, I, you got to get down to their level, you know, find out what, what they like and what they enjoy. They're very practical. They're very uh, ABC, you know, straight line. <laughs> they, 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 they can go right on the internet and get, get what they want right away. So they want something that can make money right away. They don't want to, they don't want to wait. <laughs> they, they don't, they're not talking about 20, not everybody, but a lot, they're talking about 20, 30 years. They want to know how they can make some money right now, legally, <laughs> legally. I also so, think that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'll just say uh, one thing I'll just say is that uh, the Internet has been one of the greatest things that ever happened. All you need is a computer. All you need is an idea. And you, you're in business with the world, the whole world. So it's never been easier to start your own business and do for yourself than it is right now. And, and uh, the Internet is, 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 is the key. You know, you just need a computer and you need an idea and that and you need a and you need a uh, a website. It's somebody to make your website and that's easy, you know, with and you're in business and that doesn't take a lot of money if you got the right idea or you have the right service. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go right ahead, excuse me. No problem. Hi, um, family. It's Tanji Wei. I also think that um, when we put um, information to music. It's, it's a lot more attracting to, to kids and, and us as a people in general. So um, if there was something to like money, 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 money or something like that, you know, it, it um, draws them in. If, if we put some music to it and, and make it exciting or even get um, 
a rapper, a community rapper or something to, to partner with us when, when we bring in this literacy. Um, I'm excited to say that my 20 year, 20 year old has been doing really well um, saving his money. Um, mm -hmm. He um, is the co-founder of Onyx Village Connection, our nonprofit where we feed the homeless. And when we did start making money, I, I don't even call it a salary, I call it a love offering. Um, but even when we start getting our love offering, you know, I, I told him that he had to save some money. And then he got a um, construction job um, for a semester, a couple of months, because he, um, after high school, he took off a semester. And so I said, well, you don't have to pay rent, but you have to start saving your money. So um, each pay period, he gives me a thousand dollars to save. <laughs> so um, he's been Beautiful. doing good. He has, he's fallen short um, a time or two, but um, year before last, he, he saved $10,000. And then um, last year he saved, I think it was like $13,000. Um, but the thing is with last year, he, um, he want, he said he wanted a new car, another car. So, um, I said, well, then you have to have two savings. You have to have your regular savings and you have to have your vehicle savings. So he started mm -hmm. to do that. And then he saw a 19, or no, yeah, 1966 Ford Mustang and, um, he knew that that's my dream car. <laughs> and so he came to me with a picture <laughs> of that vehicle and told me that he wants to purchase it for me. <laughs> so mm. my 20 year old purchased me a 1966 um, wow. Ford Mustang. <laughs> so he sacrificed his vehicle savings for his mom. So then I was like, well, you can't afford two cars. So what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'll just start all over, mom. But you've been talking about this car all my life. So <laughs> uh, that was just a wonderful, awesome gift. But he's still saving. Mm -hmm. He's still saving. That's a blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it makes you. Well, I know you story. proud. That, that's outstanding. Be beautiful you know, story. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very impressive young man if you've ever met him mm -hmm. so looks like sister found a way he's doing a lot of things right with him you just, thank you Bob. Uh, can i you ask you another... david david uh, uh i know this is going to take us in another direction uh, this is uh, i'm asking for your opinion um bitcoin what what do you think that that's a good investment I, what I do, I, I haven't been involved in Bitcoin and I've never gotten involved in it. My son is very much involved in it and he's a believer in it. It, it has, uh, it has really volatile, <laughs> as we've seen, it was almost, it was up to 60,000, almost $70,000 last year. And it went down to almost $16,000 this year. So as far as Bitcoin, if you're going to get into, this is what I tell people, don't put more than 5% of your portfolio on it diversify and put that 5% that you don't, you may not expect to get back or you do, because it's a possibility. It's just like investing in a, a Silicon Valley, a startup. Five out of 10 of them, five out of, you know, seven or eight of them don't make it, but the ones that do make it, they make it rich, you're going to get rich. <laughs> so no, I don't, uh, I tell it, no, I'm not a believer in it myself. I know a lot of young people believe it. And if you do, I say, don't put more than five or ten percent at the maximum amount of your money into it if you're going to do it, and put an amount that you certainly don't need immediately. Uh, you don't need it immediately, and uh, a, a amount that you can maybe afford to lose and not not have to rely on that. I, I would. Uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, and that is, uh, when you when you talk about savings, um, do you consider things like a Roth IRA uh, a good? Oh. Oh, Roth IRA is tremendous. What's so great about the Roth IRA is that when you take that money out, you don't have to take pay taxes on it. It's money that you've already paid taxes on it. So it's, the Roth IRA is a great savings vehicle. Uh, whereas if you have a money in a 401k or all other investment accounts, 
and you take that money out for retirement or whenever, you have to pay taxes on it. But the Roth IRA, you don't. That's after-tax money that you're putting into it. And I, I forget the amount. It's, I mean, it's up to, I don't know, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a year, twelve, I don't know, seventy. I'm I don't know exact amount. Now you can put a year in a Roth IRA, but it's a it's 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 a great saving vehicle. And and it's they're they're just putting your money in the stock market, but the, the advantage is there's no taxation when you take that money out for sure. I have One a question, things, Baba. Go, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Um, what is the best way to help your savings to grow because your savings are in this 0.01% of interest. How do we, what's the best way to get our savings to grow? Well, right now that's, that's no longer the case. That was the case a year ago, but uh, you can go right now and you can get the, you can get four or 5% on your money uh, in most banks. Stay away from, most banks are going to be a little lower, but if you, if you, Check around. For instance, I have what we call a Robinhood account. That's an account that I have on my computer and I, I'm, I invest in. It's one of those the young people got into uh, when we started the, the COVID pandemic. And I earn like 4% on my money right there. Every dime I have, oh, 4% uh, interest. Hi. Right. There's Mint. No, I'm Mint. a um, Caribou Coffee customer. Uh, oh, Sister uh, Judy, mute, you, mute yourself. <laughs> I, I just did. All right. Oh, okay. So there's a, there's a mint. There's there's apps. You, if you go on and check online, don't go to your bank because their banks banks rates the big banks, the Wells Fargo, the uh, you know all the bank America, Their rates are going to be lower than everybody else. I mean, I saw I, I got something today on my phone from Capital One talking about oh we'll give you two or three percent on your money. It's like I got Robin Hood. I can get four, four point five percent of my money. So, so Robin Hood is a bank, Baba. It's it's a uh, it's it's uh, it, it's an investment company basically. It's an investment company. Uh, or you can go to Mint. Look up Robin Hood. Look up Mint. These are all uh, these are all new companies in the new era. Young people have known about them online. It's come about in the last five to 10 years, and they generally pay a higher percentage. So, Robin, if you give me your information, I can send you the information. I'll gladly send you the information, or I'll send you maybe a couple options that you can have for, for investing and earning. Uh, and you don't have to lock it up because normally, if you're going to lock it, if you have five or six percent, you got to tie your money up for two or three years. No, you get right now four or five percent without tying that money up for an extended period of time, which means you can go get that money anytime you want to. Whoa, so I will yeah. send you that inf I'll go send you that information. If you give me your information before we leave here, I'll get that information to you. Go right okay, I will. Thank you. Okay, we got uh, Sugar D and then uh, Judy. Go ahead. Yes, uh, right now I'm getting ready to retire next year. And uh, I had my, we had our retirement in a, regular IRA and then I was I was thinking do we change it do I need to change it over to the Roth or I know it's gonna cost me right to do something like that. What do you recommend this way I guess when well, what I everybody's situation is different. And right. I would have to you know look at your own individual situation, your tax situation, what your short and long term goals and plans are before I would make a recommendation to switch it over to uh and I, uh, Roth IRA. I, yeah, I will say this here. Normally what happens, a lot of times when you're with an employer, they will have a, a 401k plan, a plan. And what right. you're allowed to do, you're, when you retire, you can transfer that out to a private plan. So people have to transfer it about without a penalty to another investment company if you cho choose. Some companies will let you keep it there. Other companies, you, you can take it out. Okay, but, can I hire so you, you to look to at find that? An investment. <laughs> Big I mean, pardon, I, I'm sorry. I said, can I hire you to look at that? No, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm but dead that, serious. You know what? I, I try to, what I'm building right now is a network of, of Black financial people in Sacramento that, that I can refer people to that, that can, 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 can you feel I live very, in Virginia. Very capable. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, there should be some, there is, matter of fact, there is a, Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, 
there's a, a, a African American female. She's known nationwide, and uh, she's right there in Richmond. I forget her name, but she does seminars nationally, and I got a chance to know her. I mean, not to know her, but I didn't know who she was. She was right. not personally, but she's right there in Richmond, Virginia, and you might. Uh, she has a show, I think, there. Uh, what part of Virginia are you in? I live in Hampton, and Richmond's an hour away, like up the street. I mean, I go to Richmond. Right, right. My, my son graduated from Hampton University, so I know exactly and That's where around you the are. corner from yeah. where I live. But, oh, but, okay. But she's but in Richmond. I'm sure that you could help me with. Oh, yes, definitely. That, that she's in the business of doing that, most definitely. I can get that information for you. If you can leave that information, I can find it. I was going through... Uh, my emails the other day and I ran up on her name again and her, her again. So we can definitely do that. About it. What, what matter of fact, let me take your name down now. Okay. Is this okay? My name, <laughs> my name is, my name's Doris Robinson. Okay. And I'll go ahead and give you my number. Please hit me up anytime, but make sure you realize that I'm three hours. I, what I'll do is I will text her information to you. What's your phone number? 757-660-2570. Two five seven zero. That's okay. seven five seven six six zero two five seven zero. I, I would appreciate seven. it because I'm trying to get it together because I'm retiring September twenty twenty four. Okay, I'm sure she'd be very good you talking to you. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to get the other lady's number before we leave as well, so I can get that information. Okay, Sister Judy, are you having? Sure. Well, are you there still? What was her name? Sister Judy, where'd you go? I'm here. I, I thought he was asking a question still. No. Sister Judy, what's your information so I can get that information to you as well about the savings information? That was mom, wasn't that mom? Okay. Oh, I oh, think oh, that was another sister. Oh, 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 okay. Hold on just a second. So so that the, the, the person that was giving you her information, her name is Doris. Right, I have that one. Oh, okay, and you I got her it. number? Robinson. Yeah, she's yes, talking about Mama and Gina. Mama and Gina. Mama and Gina. Mama and Gina. Yes, it was me. Okay, so uh, the next person is, her, her name is spelled N-G-I-N-A. Mm -hmm. And and uh, she can give you her number. 510-318-5500. Six nine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they have a plan to that if you refer somebody, they they'll get buy give you a piece of stock, give you a stock free. <laughs> but one of the so I got but you I'll get both of those information out to both of you. One one of the things that when I heard you speaking earlier that I wanted to say something about is uh, and I've had a complete change on this. Is we're, because African-Americans, a lot of people are so burdened with student loan debt or, or student debt, is that I tell people there's no shame in going to a junior college for two years and you know, it costs you $3,000, $3,500. If you get a, a Pell Grant, it may not cost you anything. Uh, and then you can go transfer to any, any institution you want to. The degree, the degree doesn't say you went to a junior college for 10 years. It says you graduated from Cal Berkeley. <laughs> or wherever you graduate from. And another thing which is that, 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 I, that I believe in is that everybody doesn't have to go to college. Everybody isn't made to go to college. There's a lot of people that are working blue collar trades and have skills that are making more money than, than PhDs and college graduates. You can make their jobs now and you can make $100,000. There's some plumbers making over $100,000. There's electricians making over $100,000, you know? And so we're, I read something the other day, and this is, I think this is very critical. For the first time, it said that some companies are beginning to hire people that don't, they don't have to have a degree, that they're going based on knowledge base and what your skills are. And so we have to get back. We have a lot of talented people, a lot of talented brothers and sisters. And I, and I think this is one of our problems with our young people, young brothers and sisters, is that we've been, we have this this prism, this mold, we, this way of thinking that we try to fit them in there and they're not made for that and they get very frustrated and they don't realize that there's another way. I believe my philosophy is there's something for everybody in this, this world, young man or young woman, they just have to find out what it is. 
that that's something maybe for them to be in the trade, you know, to be in a trade. Make you can make like I said six figures in a trade, and uh, you don't necessarily have to graduate from college with all that college debt. <laughs> yes, I, may I, just I? To say that? Yeah. So right here. Um, I'm sorry. Sister Judy. Oh, well, Sister okay, Judy had her, her hand up, and then the next, then then the next part, then Thandi way. Uh, go ahead, Judy. Yes. Good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was going to share. My son, he graduated from Hampton as well. He's a Hamptonian. Um, okay. <laughs> but but also, um, I was going to say, my partner, he's a financial advisor, insurance strategist, and he teaches mm -hmm. um, financial literacy and at the natural um, hair show here in Atlanta and the Bronner brothers and several other places. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he basically stresses, um, he, he originally worked with teachers, um, lots of teachers board of education here in, I'm in Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. And what he teaches now mostly is dealing with life insurance, whole life insurance. A lot of people are leveraging he's moving a lot of teachers out of their 401ks and out of their um Roth IRAs other you know other professions mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there you can leverage and build your cash value and there's a lot you can do with life insurance he places a lot of different riders on those insurance policies so he gets mm -hmm. you out so you can get your money out without penalty and without waiting for a change you know all of the different requirements right. that allow you to move your money so that's mm -hmm. been very that's another alternative that a lot of people um, are in term insurance but they're not realizing that many of the banks um, he shares that lots of banks own hundreds of life insurance policies that's how they leverage money um, is mm -hmm. through life insurance using it as a tax uh, as a legal tax shelter um, mm -hmm. especially for businesses, you can put your money in life insurance and you can take it in and out in 48 hours without any penalty. So that's another thing that he teaches. Maybe one day he'll come on and share that as well. And I'd like to get your information. But the one comment I did want to make was kind of the piggyback on what you just said. Um, I'm really interested in working with youth and my, my kind of one of my issues is that we don't really, you know, as people that are baby boomers and a lot of the people who have a lot of information and we've gone through this foundation of the civil rights movement the black power movement you know we've had experience and a foundation that we you know we see things in a different way but the young people unfortunately we didn't necessarily pass that torch and continue mm -hmm. to groom our youth it kind of became a generation gap right. and so now I have a, my daughter she's just turned 29 and she and many of the other young people as you mentioned you know they don't think they think in a whole new they don't have the same foundation first of yeah. all as far as the racism and discrimination that we kind of have sometimes it's something that is real but it for, for a lot of young people they look at that as baggage and they're not they mm -hmm. have a whole new way of thinking so right uh, sure. my, my think yeah, so my thoughts are that, you know, we are not, the only way we're going to make some progress before we leave the planet with all the knowledge that we have, if we don't communicate and start having dialogues and trying to listen to their, they're all over YouTube talking about cryptocurrency, the metaverse, they're talking about all kinds of new ways mm -hmm. they're making money and they're and they're into the instant gratification they want right they're living the life they have a lot of money and they're spending a lot of money so if we don't if we want to be able to make any grounds with our young people we've got to get involved with listening to what they have to say trying to understand and meeting them halfway so that we can communicate those things that are valuable to them that we know can help them but also learn from them because you know, sometimes we're so stuck in the past and tradition and history, and we're knowledgeable about that. But we have to be able to, you know, the young people are interested in now and the future, you know, there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just something I want to say that we need to, I think, work more at having a, a dialogue. And my daughter's calling me. I'm waiting to pick her up. I'm sorry, I've got to change the line. No I'm on my thank phone you. in the car. Thank you, Sister Judy. Hey, thank you, uh, Sister Judy. Now, Tandy Way, before you uh, get to your question, um, 
Uh, there was a question in the uh, chat. It says, thank you for the great information. Is buying gold and silver a good way to invest? Where do you, where do you learn about investing in gold and silver? I, I have to say that I, <laughs> I don't know much about that. I know what the price of still, I know what the price of gold is right now at around $1,600 an ounce. And it, 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 it runs in an inverse relationship with the stock market a lot of times. And people, in times of uncertainty, uh, in times of high interest rate, in times of security, people want to buy gold because they know they got something they can hold on to it and it's always going to be there. But again, I tell people, I look at gold almost like um, the Bitcoin. I'm back. <laughs> I, I wouldn't put more than five. If you're going to do it, I wouldn't put more than five or 10 percent of your portfolio in it and there are mutual funds there are gold mutual funds there are funds there are, there are, there are mutual funds there are five thousand mutual funds and you can find you can invest in anything you want to they're trying to move the bitcoin over that but there are mutual funds that you can invest in that just allow you to buy the gold mines that you can buy the gold mine stocks and uh but I, if, if you're not an experienced investor i would advise you to talk to a financial advisor uh, before you before you make that leap into to goal. But, and again, if you're going to do it on yourself individually, no more than five to 10% of your portfolio, uh, if you feel confident enough uh, to, to do that. Let me say this here. There's some, there's a, on the Robinhood app, uh, there is a think and swim platform, which will allow you, if you, to practice investing, so if you want to learn how to invest in gold, you could practice investing in gold without actually doing it. They call it paper trading, <laughs> paper trading. And you can get, if you, and when you get proficient enough, you can go on over and start investing in the real stock market. And so there's, there's that's something that a lot of the young people get. My son turned me on the paper trading. <laughs> you know, uh, before is, I got so I started that, investing uh, the options. Is that Robin Hood invest, buy and trade? Is that, the, is that the app that you're referring to? Uh, it's, the, it's the only Robin Hood I know probably. It's green. And they have, okay, it's green. All right. Green. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the rock. You, we know the old Robin Hood we used to see growing up the old movies. This is the, the new version. This is uh, the small people against the big, the big corporations. Let me say one thing in reference to what I heard earlier. There's three parts in my book. One part is how to grow wealth which is invest in the stock market, real estate, start a business. The second part is in line with what she said earlier about life insurance. That's how you maintain your wealth. Uh, because if something happens to you, you could have the best laid plan, but if that income goes away and something happens to that, that the spouse, uh, that means that income is gone and it's not replaced. So that's when I think the importance of, of, of uh, life insurance. Also disability insurance, you become disabled, you can't work. You're only gonna get a certain percentage of your, your income that you make. So this is all part of the maintaining your wealth or long-term care, which is very, very expensive if you get sick and you have to go into an old folks home. I shouldn't say that, or long-term care home. Very, very expensive, so get it as early as you can. But those are all part of the maintaining wealth. You grow, you maintain, then you pass it on. The third part is this here. Have a will and trust. How many of you have a will? I've never seen, there's, we all know of so many black families have been broken up where brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles aren't talking to each other because when mama died, uh, there was no will. And some people wanted to buy it, sell the house and other people, no, we should keep it in the house, the family and let, and let uh, the young boys still stay there. <laughs> so have a will, get a trust. You don't want it to go to probate because if you go, to, this is part of passing on your will. Don't let, when you pass, you don't want it to go into probate because that can take 15 to 20% of your money. So oh, have a will. Which, yeah. Have a will which outlines who you want your money to go to. Have a trust which will rent uh, from going into probate. And so it won't be taxed. Great, your hard earned dollars won't be go to the government. And so it would go to the people that you intended to go to. That's part of passing the window on, passing that wealth on. Because you can work hard all those years and accumulate. And if you don't have a will or trust, you know, that money can go back to the government and your, your, uh, 
beneficiaries have to wait three or four or five years to get the money. And then plus it's tax. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Okay, we had um, Sister Thandiwe was going to uh, ask a question. And then we have a question in the chat uh, from King Kevin. As a contractor renovating homes, what are the best options to invest my profits? Now think about that, David, but Thandiwe, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, thank you for bringing up um, community college. My son attends community college, and um, he's actually contemplating writing a book about um, community college and that it is a viable way of um, mm -hmm. obtaining higher education. He's getting nice. really frustrated with people when they, <laughs> when they talk about community college. Well, in the state of California, um, many could qualify for going to college um, free. So he right. is attended college free. He has a stipend for books. He even has um, different cards. They, he has a, a cafeteria card where he has X wow. amount of dollars that he could use towards free mm -hmm. lunch. And um, there's a, a um, Ujima program there and some other programs there where they give them um, gift cards for, for gas and for grocery and things wow. like that. I so, um, <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of resources that are available at community college mm -hmm. and um, many people kind of look down on it. So he's really frustrated mm -hmm. about that. So he was awarded $4,000 scholarship at, in one program last year. And they did not give him any of the money because they said that he he couldn't use it for college since he um, didn't pay for college. So he was like, well, can I use it for like computer equipment or, or something like that? And they wouldn't even grant that. So he's really frustrated that um, he's asked to talk to high school students and, and different students. He's the college ambassador at, at um, Kenyatta College in Redwood City. But oh, most of the parents and, and people in the community, they really look down to community college. So he's she been um, advocating for community college. He was invited to speak at um, some future with some future teachers at San Francisco uh, University of San Francisco in regards to his community college experience and how mm -hmm it is a viable way for um, higher education. So he is really out there advocating for community yeah. college throughout the Bay Area. And I, I just dropped him off his, um, at the airport. He's on his way um, to talk in Southern California about his community yeah. college experience. So that is, yeah. That's a beautiful mm -hmm. story. Thank you very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. All right, now, um, brother uh, David, so uh, K King Kevin's question in the chat is, as a contractor renovating homes, what are the best options to invest my profits? Well, I think uh, he's probably, he should be owning some of them homes that he's renovating. <laughs> For, is that the first question I would say? I would, be, I would try to own some of those homes you could get renovate because uh, again- Kevin, you wanna come on? Can you come on and, 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 and talk about that? King Kevin, go ahead. You're, you're, you're muted, but, you're muted, but, but, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. Yes, I agree with everybody. Um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, yes, uh, I renovate homes and um, do mold remediation here in Atlanta, Georgia. The business is doing pretty good um, because I do such an array of things. Um, and, and you're right, and, you know, I should be owning some of these homes. That's, that's the next thing we're working on, I'm working on right now. I have a couple of investors who are extremely wealthy that you know that that has seen my portfolio and the work I've, I've posted online, and so they want to invest with me on purchasing some of these properties so that I can, um, you know, they'll put up the capital for the house for the home. They pay for the labor, and and we'll go like 50, 50 or I will pay for all the materials, and then I right. I'll get like uh, you know, there will be sixty forty. They'll get sixty, I get forty, uh, so to speak. So yeah, I'm definitely moving along the lines of. of purchasing um these properties because you know every time i work on one i'm like man i wish this was my house you know right um and i don't own a home yet but i aspire to have mm -hmm. one because i have i have two beautiful babies now for everybody who, who don't know other than sister judy i just had an another daughter uh, um last month congratulations so, you know, congratulations i appreciate it thank you thank congratulations. you congratulations 
Kevin, Thank you, you need to send me your information so I might want to invest or have people investing in California in you. You know, that's be the communication. So I need your information. <laughs> so oh, Kevin, uh, what city are you in? Oh, He's in Atlanta. Uh, he's in Atlanta, he's right? Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. So uh, Kevin, can you can hit, you drop your information in the chat uh, for us? Yeah, I do that. Uh, yeah, would you do that? And David, can you pick it up in from the chat? I don't see the chat for some reason. The chat's not showing up on my. Okay, know well, Kevin, you put it in the chat, and I'll I'll copy it down and make sure that David gets it. How about that? Oh, thanks so much. Okay. I think okay. one of the things, Kevin. Yeah. Also, if if you find a, a a financial advisor and get you started investing in mutual funds. The first way to start out is invest in what I call a Vanguard mutual fund. They beat 80% of the mutual funds out there. A mutual fund is a, an investment that invests in a bunch of companies in different industries. And they're diversified, mm -hmm. they have their own management. You can get started in one as little as $150, $100 a month. That'll get you started in, a, in the stock market. So you need to find an Afrocentric investment advisor that can tell you, you help you invest that money. If you're not, you know, put some of it in the house, but you, you, one of those houses you're renovating, but then also yeah. you need to start off that investing and in, in save, have a savings account at least three to six months. Get, get three to six months savings account. Then we want you to start investing in that mutual fund. Okay. And find your black investment advisor. If you need one, I, I'll find one that's reputable for you. So you can, put a certain amount of money of that in the stock market, which is gonna earn seven to eight percent over the last 30 years. That's what it's earned. Mm, okay? okay. So we so but but I think another important thing you said, and this is why I want to say this before I go, is that home ownership is the gateway to wealth. Home ownership is the gateway. Half of African Americans net worth, what we own is tied up in our house. 50% mm. of our wealth is tied up in our homes. Most of us, most of the middle class, most people. Also, why it's important to have a home, 75% of any African-Americans who go in business get the money to go in business from the equity they build up in their home versus only 25% of white population. So they take that equity they build up and grown in their home and they take it out and they start that business. They got the money to start their business, okay? So then of course, of course you can write, you can, you can write it off. You can, you can, you can write that uh, every, when you have a home, you can write off the interest rate, you know? So it's a, it's a tax, a big tax deduction, you know? And plus you got an advantage because you got the skills that if anything go wrong, <laughs> you can repair it yourself. You don't have to hire man. somebody else to repair it. But man, you got, you got the skill, you got the skill. And I, I you know, you know, so uh, you're on the right path, brother. But just thank you. Uh, maybe you can transfer that 50 percent one of them homes. Maybe you work on two. You work on two homes with these investors. Then the third home, you just take all that money. You made in the third home, have it transferred to your home. That's your home, third home. Take what you made in those two. That 40 percent or 60, whatever it is. Say, I don't want it. I don't want it right now. But it's mine. I don't want it for the second. But in the third one. All those three to two, two homes you build up on, plus the third one, you got you got all this equity built up for a home. So I know, you know, I don't know what you, the value of your home, you know, that you're working on, but you you follow what I'm saying, right? Oh, definitely, definitely, yes, sir. Well, you don't have to take that like third home. You got cash. You got equity already. <laughs> Ready so to take go. Take that third home is yours. Say this is going to be my home right here. The third one. <laughs> I'm gonna buy this, you know, from the uh, first two that we worked on. Mm. Without, okay. you know, there you go. All right, thank okay. you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you, David, thank you, Kevin. All right, Sister Judy has has a question. This is probably gonna be the last uh, question uh, that we take. Go ahead, Judy. Okay, I hope you can hear me. I apologize. I I can hear you. You went back on mute, uh, Judy. Yeah. Okay, I'm. I hear you now. Um, you can hear me. So what I was going to say, one of the things that, I, and I've been learning, I'm working on my license as well, my um, life insurance license, but I'm learning from um, my partner through the presentations that so many of our community, the black community, you know, we've been taught and believe that life insurance is just that money left for you 
you know, the, when you mm -hmm. go and you leave your beneficiaries with money, but life insurance, white, you know, the, you call it the larger majority, but they're using, they've been using um, life insurance as a way to build wealth. It's a wealth mm -hmm. building tool when you know how to use it that way. And when you have agents or, you know, advisors who know how to put the riders on it, you build cash value in life insurance policies very, very mm -hmm. quickly. And you can turn around the advantage to a life insurance policy and is the fact that you can you can take money in and out and no life insurance policy, you're not, it's tax free, it's, it's non-taxable. So they don't look at your income when you're reporting income for all of your other different investments. Life insurance is not counted as an income. So it's tax free money, you can take it in and out. Like I say, the way, for example, the way my partner does it, he uses riders on it put places riders on your policy so you can withdraw money out within 48 hours and you have that money in your account you know already without any tax without any kind of penalties and it's tax free so a lot of people are using it particularly building um particularly entrepreneurs and people in construction companies and all kind of things because they can put that money away and, and really hide it like a legal tax shelter. And that's the advantage. And many <laughs> coaches, some of the coaches and a lot of these um, banks, that's what I was trying to say. Banks have hundreds and hundreds of life insurance policies, one bank at a time. This is how they leverage money. So that's another avenue to look into. And that's all, and I'm sorry, I'm talking kind of, I'll just say this here. I've been with, I was with, been, I was with, I had all state insurance agency for 25 years and all the guys that lived up in Ukiah in California, Ukiah and Eureka were all the big best sellers of life insurance. And we kind of figure out there ain't no money up there. What are these guys doing? What it was, the drug dealers. All the marijuana people up there were putting their money in the life insurance policy because they could take it in and out and have no, no tracking, no tracing of it. <laughs> so that's why they were the big hitters. They had all these marijuana farmers up there were putting money in the agents of Ukai and Eureka. <laughs> and she's right. That's what they were doing in and out with all these so, expenses. So, case, so, it was a tax shelter. so case, <laughs> case in point, that's what makes life insurance such a valuable place to consider when you're retiring and moving your money and and looking at ways to move money out because as i mentioned he's taken a lot of teachers out of their 401ks and 5013bs here in georgia uh, and and instead put them in life insure whole life insurance policies because they can get their money in and out and it is a great way for people in business to build money up to build their cash value bills quickly so just wanted to share that, but thank you so much for your information. Okay, appreciate that. Really thank good. you, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, appreciate we're, that. we're- One at, of the things they do other countries do it. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, go I'm go sorry. Ahead. I was just gonna say one thing. Mm -hmm. The Asian communities, they, they put their money together, the children and buy life insurance on their parents. And, not, and, and they use it as a, and so when they pass, maybe half a million dollars go to the family besides what the, they've accumulated over the years that's another way of you know you you don't tell them this for you die but you say this is for you're going to leave this money for your children's education grandchildren's education where your grandchildren can do this and do that and help them with their marriage or what have you go ahead i'm sorry that's, oh, thank no, you for having no, me today. no i I, I we exactly. really enjoyed you i think i can speak for everyone that's on here so again uh uh, Brother David Fontaine's book, The Black Financial Literacy Wealth uh, Literacy and Wealth Building Bible. And uh, also, one of the things that he put in here that I thought was that was great. Uh, is this the one? Let's see. I, not the one. No, 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 no. Where is it? That, that. So if you go to his website, these are the 10 principles that he was talking about. If you were trying to to uh, uh, scribble them down. So his, his website is blackfinancialwealthnetwork.com. That's blackfinancialwealthnetwork.com. And then uh, you can go, you can click on wealth building guide. And these were the things, he didn't get a chance to go into all of them. He, he had 10, 10 things here 
that you can go and look at. Of course, you, if you're on Facebook, you can, uh, you can reach out to him there. And he said he didn't know about this. You can go to SoundCloud. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and his book is there. You can listen to his book on, on Sound, SoundCloud. Next week. We're looking forward to uh, Minister Amadi. He's going to be joining us. We we loved his sermon a, a, a month or so ago, and uh, he's going to be talking about affirmative prayer and prayers of petition. That's next week here at Black Knowledge Matters, uh, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, also, I wanted to share this one more thing, David. Let's see. Oh, this is me and David. We're in Cancun. And uh, <laughs> just, just happened to see him. And, and hey, what are you doing here? And uh, we had just got to seeing, I think, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Anyway, right. uh, glad. Great, great, beautiful days. Glad, glad uh, that you could join us. I, I want to thank everyone for coming and, and your wonderful questions and, and, and remarks. Uh, again, uh, I, I really recommend getting his book and, and going to his various sites to find out more about financial literacy. I want to thank uh, her sister Saraswati. She, um, she knows that I could um, miss some things. And she said, hey, have you confirmed our speaker today? And I said, yes, I have. And uh, give thanks <laughs> for that. Thank you, David. You, got, you have a party thank, thank comment uh, before, before, uh, as we close? No, it's been enjoyed and very insightful questions. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. And if any one of you want to reach out to me personally, uh, I will help you in any way I can. And it's, it's, it's a joy to see your community thriving and, and the things it's doing. It's what's necessary for if we're to move forward and move on. Right. Thank you again so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Brother David. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Hope to see you next week.